My name is Father Joe Lingen, and I have the privilege of serving as the rector of the Georgetown Jesuit community, a position I have held since 2011. Tonight, it is my honor to welcome you on behalf of Georgetown University, the Initiative of Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, and the Jesuit community of Georgetown. As rector, I serve as the religious superior of the Jesuit community. My office is a privileged one, and I live and work with kind-hearted, intelligent, dedicated, and faith-filled men. And we co-labor with equally extraordinary women and men of diverse backgrounds, political views, and religious traditions. We all serve with certain fidelity the mission of this university, and this in part is what makes this institution such a dynamic one. It is difficult, if not impossible, to capture in a few minutes and words the significance of the Jesuit identity of Georgetown, as well as the impact and importance of the leadership, writings, and ideas of John Courtney Murray. Its impact for the Society of Jesus, for Georgetown University, and for American Catholics. And while it is difficult and impossible, it has never stopped any Jesuit from speaking when given the opportunity to do so. John Courtney Murray recognized that the human person was neither born nor lives in a vacuum. He recognized, highlighted, and encouraged the importance of civil discourse and dialogue as a constitutive characteristic of our humanity. He recognized that in order for a person to fully develop as a human being, it is necessary for him or her to engage with other persons. He appreciated that the human person is not a radically autonomous individual, but capable of becoming a being who is rational and social. He recognized that we human beings need reasoned debate because it belongs to our God-given human nature to reason and to argue in civility. Such is necessary if we are to grow in order to become and behave as mature persons, all for the betterment of the human person as an individual, as well as for the betterment of humankind as a whole. Further, such growth is necessary if one is to understand and see the value of the pursuit of the common good he sought to identify the sin of seeking solely one's own betterment, for such was most often at the expense of the betterment of another and of humankind in general. Relatedly, at Georgetown, our Jesuit heritage directs our academic and educational efforts. We deeply concern ourselves with the education and formation of our students in order to prepare them for honest and compassionate engagement with the culture and society in which they are to be adult citizens. In sum, our effort is to help our students and alumni to remember that those with whom we live are our brothers and sisters, that they share with us the same short moment of life, that they seek, as we do, nothing but the chance to live out their lives in purpose and happiness experiencing what satisfaction and fulfillment they can. This human desire forms the bond of common faith. Further, this bond of common goal can begin to teach us something, for experience and history has shown that we can learn to look at those around us as fellow human beings, fellow travelers on this gifted journey of life. By God's grace, we can begin to work a little harder to bind up the wounds among us and to become, in our own hearts, brothers and sisters once again, and to see that in helping one's neighbor, no matter who that neighbor may be, a person is also helping him or herself to develop into a fully human being of integrity and dignity. Now, in its fifth year, Georgetown's Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life has organized more than 30 gatherings and conversations attended by more than 14,000 people and has become a respected place of dialogue on the application of Catholic social thought. 
the key to national and global issues. It hopes to encourage a new generation of Catholic lay leaders to become salt, light, and leaven in public life. The initiative strives to be a vital sign of Georgetown's Catholic and Jesuit identity in action. This initiative occurs under the direction of Mr. John Carr. Prior to founding the directing and directing the initiative, John served for over 20 years as director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He held a residential fellowship at the Institute of Politics of Harvard University during the academic year 2012-2013, and previously served as executive director of the White House Conference on Families and as director of the National Committee for Full Employment. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to now hand over tonight's dialogue to this evening's distinguished moderator, Mr. John Carr, who will introduce tonight's panelist. Welcome, John. <clears throat> is this working? Yes. Uh, they, they say you used to be able to tell you were at a Catholic meeting because there was no one in the front pew and uh, the audio visuals never work. So we have a crack team helping us with the audio. Uh, what happened to Father reminded me of a story I heard of an Irish pastor who had one of these lavalier mics and he was convinced it wouldn't work. He goes out and opens the mass and he says, the Lord be with you. There's something wrong with this mic. And of course, the people responded, and with your spirit. <laughs> so so uh, there's nothing wrong with this mic. Uh, for those in the back, there are a couple seats up here. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Some of you I've seen more of than my children over the last two weeks. Uh, we've had uh, three dialogues uh, on nuclear arms in North Korea, wonderful reflection on racism and faith, uh, both in Dahlgren Chapel, and now tonight focus on the legacy and the lessons from John Courtney Murray. W before he died, uh, Father Murray wrote, people of all religions and of no religion must live together in conditions of justice, peace, and civic friendship under equitable laws that protect the whole range of human rights including the right to religious freedom. It is therefore necessary for the church to show the way to justice and peace in society. He dedicated his life, his work, his writings uh, to those values, those principles. Be fair to say those are being tested today. If you look around, we see religious leaders and partisans using the story of Mary and Joseph to defend a Senate candidate. Uh, I'm trying to find a polite way to describe what he's doing, uh, seeking the attention of uh, young girls. We had religious leaders uh, blessing an abortion clinic. Uh, Melissa and others on this panel have seen lawsuits over the definition of what's a religious ministry, uh, how to handle the religious convictions of employers, and what's in a health care plan. Uh, we've had confirmation hearings where people have been asked, are you an Orthodox Catholic? Is the doctrine living within you? Uh, we have a president who says he's committed to defending religious liberty, who has three times proposed a ban, widely seen as a ban on Muslims. On this campus, a group of students uh, committed to defending traditional Catholic teaching on family and marriage have been called a hate group. And on a campus not too far from here, uh, a distinguished Jesuit, a friend of many of ours, was disinvited because he wrote a book uh, calling for a dialogue, building bridges between the church and the LBGT community. And we have our bishops uh, taking on the administration on immigration, on budget, on health care, now on taxes. And we have other religious leaders who defend the president no matter what he does. So uh, we're a long way from the vision that Father Murray offered us. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're going to try and take a look at that. I would suggest a lot of things have happened 
since Father Murray's death 50 years ago, think of the civil rights uh, revolution. Think of the women's movement. Think of the environmental movement. Uh, think of the gay rights movement. But I would suggest that among the most surprising things that have probably happened in those 50 years was the election of a Jesuit from Argentina as Pope and the election of a complete outsider as president. So our evangelical sisters and brothers, some of whom are here, our friends, often ask, what would Jesus do? Tonight, we're going to ask, what would Murray think uh, in a country led by Donald Trump and a church led by Pope Francis? And to help us lead off this discussion, we have Bishop Robert McElroy. He's the Bishop of San Diego. He was the Auxiliary Bishop of San Francisco. He's been a pastor. He's been a vicar general. Graduated from Harvard in three years uh, with a history degree. Got another history degree at Stanford. Went to a number of prestigious ecclesial institutions. He's written a book, The Search for American Public Theology, The Contributions of John Courtney Murray. There are still a few copies available on Amazon. Uh, you don't have to pay full price. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, he is a leader in our conference, which is where I got to know him. He has been to Georgetown twice for programs of our initiative. He gave a wonderful uh, description on the moral limits of partisanship to one of our first dialogues, and he opened our uh, Catholic Evangelical Leadership Poverty Summit on Poverty with a description of the biblical and um, moral teachings of uh, the Catholic Church on poverty. So he is, uh, he is informed, he is intelligent, he is humble, he has a sense of humor, uh, he is pastoral, he is principled. If you want to know what a Francis bishop looks like, this is what a Francis bishop looks like. And it looks pretty good to me. Uh, so my question is, what would Murray think? What do you think? How do his principles apply in this surprising situation of where we have a pope that no one expected leading our church in uh, not different directions, but perhaps with different priorities and certainly uh, a new sense of authenticity? What, what does it mean to think about faith, the common good, and a democracy in a church led by Pope Francis? Uh, well, I think, first of all, it's important to keep in mind Murray's life trajectory was surprising to him and to those who knew him. He, he began work as a, as a teacher uh, uh, in spiritual theology and dogmatic theology and he came to grapple with one of the most important questions in the history of the church in the United States, which is the issue of religious liberty. What is the proper role for religious liberty? What are the proper contours for religious liberty? And um, in the course of that theological investigation, discussion, dialogue, uh, he was silenced for a period of time. He was uh, told uh, by his Jesuit superiors at the behest of the Vatican that he could not write on this subject anymore. It was a very difficult time for him. He went through great suffering. And yet then he was able to write again, and he persisted. He was one of the great architects at the council on this question which helped reconcile what was the lived reality in the United States, namely a vibrant, robust constitutional order in which religious liberty was present and vibrancy in the Catholic community uh, had been historically established for many years in a way that taught, the Catholic experience in the United States taught the world how to think about religious liberty in a new way, the Catholic world, that is, and helped the transformation of Catholic theology. So I would say in terms of Pope Francis, there, there are many parallels in Pope Francis's life. He started out as a, as a 
a young Jesuit. He became actually a superior early on and uh, didn't have a good experience in that uh, and went through a period in a sense of, uh, in which he was in isolation too, in, uh, he was, in which he was in the desert. And yet he didn't give up, he didn't become embittered. He came back and he struggled and he, he deepened his own insights of faith, of priesthood, and of a sense of the, his relationship with God and who God is for us. And thus has come to have this transformative role, I think, in the life of the church now. So I think there are these parallels between them. And um, uh, so I think on, on those levels, there is a resonance between the two of them. Um, there are differences, though, I'd have to say this, in that um, John Courtney Murray was a man who was a very precise thinker. Um, he never wrote a book as a book. He wrote articles. And uh, they were uh, elegantly written. They were uh, deep in their thought. They were configured with great intricacy. Uh, Pope Francis, on the other hand, speaks to us so often from the heart and from the hip in a way that is meant to reveal to us, again, constantly pointing to the presence of God in the world and who God is. And, and uh, Pope Francis is a, is, a, is a man of gesture and symbol. Um, that was not John Courtney Murray. John Courtney Murray was a man of the mind. And he left us a great legacy because he left us ways of thinking about the relationship between church society and the state. And he helped work out that relationship in a way which is still enduring for us. Uh, he, he, Murray spoke about the importance of institutions in American society. He was one of the primary interlocutors between Catholicism and American society at mid-century. He taught the church how to talk to the wider society of the United States. He talk, taught Americans how to think of and understand in a better way, uh, uh, people of all faiths, to understand the church and what Catholic theology is, what the <coughs> Catholic community uh, is really about. Murray believed this, as you had this quote here about us living all together, all people of all faiths and no faith. Murray called that conspiracy, but he, he meant the Latin term for breathing together. He said that in the United States, the fact that we are different communities of faith, living alongside of each other, neighbors to each other, co-workers, educating our children together, growing old together, but people of different faiths, that we do it in the United States in relative peace as people of different faiths. And we can do that because of the constitutional order that has emerged here and the conception of religious liberty we have. Um, and it's interesting, you know, Pope Francis, when, when, he, when he speaks and thinks of the United States, it is with a great appreciation for that, uh, that element of American life too. So there's some consonants there, but they are very different people. They are very different people. Yeah. Well, you said that uh, Murray was very precise, wrote these long, complicated articles. Um, our president doesn't do that. No, uh, no, no, he doesn't. I don't think Father Murray would tweet. Uh, no, I can't, that I can't imagine that. <laughs> Although, you know, it would be, it's an interesting, I will, I will point this out. No, he would not tweet. It would go against his nature. But I would have to say, he writes with such precision, he might be able to tweet, he could fit his uh, most important thoughts, I think, into a small number of words so that he could well, tweet if he wanted to. Yeah. Well, a tweet storm. That would yeah. be an interesting assignment for some class here at Georgetown. <laughs> Turn Murray into tweets. Um, I don't know how you would grade that, but the uh, uh, so you got Murray, who had high expectations for democracy, tried to bring us all together. Mm -hmm. We have a president elected with a very different message and agenda. What would he think of sort of politics as we face it today? 
I, I think he would be appalled by politics as we have it today because Murray believed that politics uh, at its worst was tribal and uh, that uh, people voted and uh, approached each other in, in partisanship uh, because of their race or class or their history. And uh, he felt that in the United States, the, the reason that the United States have been able to succeed well, in contrast to some of the uh, paroxysms that occurred in, in Europe during the, the ideological periods of revolution and then the terrible events of World War I and World War II within the European societies, uh, was, was that there was dialogue uh, between men and women here, and between different groups here, and that that was the key. And uh, sadly, there, uh, there is not that dialogue now of substance. In addition, he felt, he believed in a concept that was called, the, he called it the public consensus. In the 50s and 60s, there was a group of social scientists, Richard Hofstetter, who was a historian, um, and uh, Daniel Borston, uh, A.A. Uh, uh, a. A. Burrell, who was an economist. And, and they wrestled with the question, why is it that the United States did not have those same revolutionary uh, battles that Europe did, and they, and they said it was because there was a basic consensus in American society, and, and that's uh, uh, shared institutions, shared beliefs about uh, the rights of the human <coughs> person. Now, I'd have to say that consensus, as it was uh, presented in their thought, was a very white male elite uh, consensus, you know, and so it was limited in that. Uh, to that degree. For Murray, it wasn't, though, what was there. For Murray, the consensus was the principles of natural law, that that's what bound the nation together, uh, a, a sense of that we are here on this earth uh, with a common dignity given to us by God, that we are bound together as communities, that government has a proper order within society, but it is a limited order, uh, that there is an important uh, demand for us to treat each other with dignity in our dialogue and not to treat each other as, as means rather than ends. He rejected what was very common at the time, the, the interest group driven um, elements of politics. Uh, uh, he, he, would, he would not be sympathetic to identity driven politics now. Um, and mm -hmm. he basically, he had a, the, the period after World War II, and uh, you know, I often forget this now, but after World War II, the, the, the world was so devastated. How could the horrors of this war have happened? And it wasn't just the horrors of the war, but the horrors of the collapse of civilizations that had occurred le leading to the war. And so uh, Murray said that what had happened and what was continuing to be a problem, because uh, it was the United States, particularly with the uh, McCarthyism, was a spiritual crisis in the temporal realm, he called, where there's not uh, a sense of commonality in society and a sense of substantive truths which bind people together, that people share in common, that they didn't have a shared identity, and that those were not rooted in the major truths of the dignity of the human person and what that means. And so, um, I think he would say now, for example, there's a great hollowness in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, we're not bound together. Uh, Pope John Paul II had a, has a beautiful principle, and I think that's what we need for the renewal of our society now, is, is a conversion in our society to solidarity. That, John Paul, it existed this concept before in Catholic theology, but John Paul II really made it uh, substantial. Solidarity is this. It's the recognition that we are graced by God to live in the society of which we are members. And we all are debtors of that society. And thus, our first approach to the society as a whole is not what's there for me, but how am I a debtor to the society? How can I build it up? And it's that which is not there now. 
And, mm -hmm. and until we can <clears throat> come to a greater sense of that, I fear our dialogue will be, will be empty and poisonous. And, and I fear we won't be able to mobilize effectively. The other part of that is Murray was a believer in institutions of American life. And not in a partisan sense. Now, he, he, if I had to identify him, I would say he was an Eisenhower Republican in terms of, of, of his party leanings. He was very close uh, with uh, the Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce and that kind of internationalist wing of the Republican uh, group and, and very much at home. But uh, he, he, he believed that uh, the major institutions of American life needed to be uh, nonpartisan, like the court, like the executive agencies of work, and needed to be respected for that. Mm -hmm. that. That if we drag every institution into the both partisan debates uh, and the, the bitterness of confrontation or interest group driven debates in our society, then we'll make it impossible to sustain the type of nation that we have been and need to continue to be. And I just mm -hmm. so. You've really set a strong framework for that. You mentioned Claire Booth Luce, and uh, some of you have seen this. This is the cover of Time Magazine, December 12th, 1960. I think it's the last time a Jesuit was on the cover of uh, <laughs> Time Magazine. And uh, several things have, a lot has changed since then. Time Magazine. What about the is, Pope? Yeah. <laughs> you got me. A uh, couple things have. It was uh, 25 cents uh, an issue and seven dollars a year, so uh, that's changed. Yeah. But the essay that went with this would have been impossible to. Uh, I urge you to take a look at it. But this was a man who thought about things in such a different way that challenged Catholics and others that Time Magazine felt the need shortly after the election of a Catholic president for the first time. It's important to remember Billy Graham and Norman Vincent Peale were heads of committees that said a Catholic should not be elected president because he would take orders from the Pope. So this was an ambassador of dialogue, an ambassador for the common good. You have spent your work as an ambassador of dialogue and the common good in very difficult circumstances. Uh, Melissa is a scholar, uh, an attorney, uh, she's been a public servant, she's a friend, uh, she's now at the Brookings Institute. Uh, she served as a special assistant to President Obama, an executive director of the White House Office on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. It's almost as clunky a title as ours. Uh, she's a Baptist. She went to school at Baylor. She has a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania. She worked at Wake Forest. She worked for the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. She worked at the Pew Forum. But she was chair of the Obama uh, Committee of Religious Leaders. And a couple things I experienced with her. One was, in the middle of that, we had the beginning of the HHS controversy. And Melissa was the chair of the committee who challenged the administration for its narrow definition of religious ministry. Not an easy thing to do. Yet they still respected her enough that they brought her in to run the faith-based office. And then you had the delicate task of trying to sort through uh, what the alternatives might be in light of that criticism. The other experience I've had with Melissa, which is dear to me, not necessarily to you, uh, is Galen Carey here? Where is Galen? Uh, I don't see him. But uh, he came for the food. <laughs> anyway, he was leader of the National Committee for, uh, uh, Association. Association of Evangelicals. He and I went to visit Melissa and said, we have a great idea. We're going to have a summit on poverty at Georgetown with Catholics and evangelicals. And we would like President Obama to come, not to give a speech, but to be on a panel on poverty with different points of view. Well, this is not your typical request, and she could have thrown us out of the office. I thought it was so unlikely, I didn't even tell President DeJoya that I invited President Obama to come to Georgetown. 
And I think your colleagues thought it was pretty unlikely as well. But we kept talking, and I went down to the president's office, and I wrote him a note, and I said, I have invited the president here, but don't worry, he's not going to come. We've asked him to be on a panel. And I assumed there was a similar dialogue going on in your shop. And uh, in late May, I got a phone call from Melissa who said, the president's coming on Tuesday. <laughs> and I walked down to the president's office, and uh, I said, you know that thing I told you was not going to happen? <laughs> it's going to happen on Tuesday. And one of the people who shall remain nameless said he can't come on Tuesday because that's the day we set up the chairs for graduation. <laughs> but Melissa and I were the only ones, along with Galen, who thought this might be possible. And some of you were there. It was a remarkable mm -hmm. discussion. You were there, yeah. Bishop where the President of the United States, Robert Putnam, uh, the head of the American Enterprise Institute, talked together about how you build common ground about overcoming poverty. So my question for you, Melissa, is given your experience as a scholar, as uh, an attorney, as somebody in the White House, this is a matter of bitter dispute. This has gotten a lot more complicated since Murray. Where are the areas of conflict? Where are the areas of common ground? Where are the flashpoints? And where have you found that we can bring people together? Great. Well, yes, and I have to say that the president loved this event at Georgetown. I'm not even sure if a sitting president had ever been on a panel before. But it is <laughs> President Obama's great joy to be on a panel. And uh, I rode back from that event with him, and he was just on the moon about how wonderful it was. So thanks to Georgetown again for hosting him that day. Um, so yes, the, there's a lot of uh, conflict, but also common ground. Uh, I know when I worked at the White House, one of the things I thought about, um, and it came to mind again tonight, is uh, John Courtney Murray's statement about the religion clauses of the First Amendment are not articles of faith, but articles of peace. And I really saw that in a special way when I was working at the White House, how we have this wonderful tradition in the United States of coming together across faith and beliefs to work together. And it's not, it's often sort of a quiet story that doesn't get much attention, mm -hmm. but it is an important story. And I saw it again and again, whether we were talking about coming together to welcome refugees or to advocate for comprehensive immigration reform, to work on poverty like we talked about at the conference, um, to work on child and maternal health around the world, global development. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And there's such rich networks of Catholics, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, um, Sikh, uh, non-believers, and others who, who just make it their practice to come together across faith and belief to work together. And that remains true even in this difficult time. It's not getting a lot of attention, but it remains true. And it's a great treasure that we have in the United States. And we look around the world, we should remember how precious that is and hang on to it with all our might as it's being challenged today um, and under stress. I think that you know some of the areas of conflict, and here I'll just focus on some religious liberty areas, I think we're seeing, it's no secret, that we're seeing um, when we have competing human rights claims, claims for religious liberty pitted against claims for LGBT equality or claims for reproductive rights, then that could become a very hot and difficult topic right now. And one of the main problems that I see in that, in that sphere is that there are too many that are just being dismissive of each other's claims. You know, when those claims clash, we have some that are completely dismissive of religious liberty claims and others who are quick to dismiss claims of LGBT people for equality or women for reproductive rights. And, you know, going back to John Courtney Murray, um, I think he was so good at trying to encourage a dialogue across differences on issues like this. And I think that we have to really work hard to continue that tradition because oftentimes the people who are dismissing each other aren't even in the same room anymore and don't know each other, aren't talking to each other. And so we have to keep at work in building dialogue, sustaining dialogue that already exists 
and then connecting people for dialogue and creating good context for dialogue where people don't even know each other right now. That's a real problem for us. You have seen up close the interactions <laughs> between religious leaders and senior political leaders, in your case, a president, maybe a vice president. Uh, I, I, recently there was a picture of a group of evangelical leaders. President Trump doesn't have a council like President Obama has a group of evangelical leaders. And they were all crowded around laying hands and praying for him. And people, some people thought that was just terrible. Why well, remember a similar picture? early in the Obama administration where progressive religious leaders were all gathered around laying hands and uh, praying. I think praying for the president is a good thing. We should all do it every day. But how do you see a grown-up relationship between uh, White House and religious leaders when there are areas of serious conflict and very significant agreement and common ground? How do my experience, I'll be candid, you were an exception to this, but people in the White House want cheerleaders. They want chaplains. They don't want constructive criticism. They don't, frankly, very often don't want much consultation. What are the directions, what are the dangers in the relationship between major national religious leaders and the leaders of our country? Well, I think, John, you hit the nail on the head and something that you often say when uh, religious leaders should aim to be engaged but not used. And, um, you know, that is so important. And it's important for us to think about whether we're progressive or conservative or somewhere in between because it's seductive, you know, being in that White House. You get in there and suddenly you forget everything you wanted to say that was challenging and tough because you know, you're in the White House or the Oval Office sometimes, and that's a pretty seductive place. Um, so I think it's, it's very important for us to hold each other accountable um, you know, and, and hold you know, uh, within our own communities and across communities where we have positions of trust with conservatives that we trust if we're progressives or progressives we trust if we're conservatives to say, how does this look to you? Do you think we're just charging, um, you know, our responsibility, especially if we're representing Christians in public life, for example, are we living up to our Christian responsibilities? Are we becoming lapdogs for a political party or a political faction? And you know, down that way lies you know, a great danger. So we have to hold each other accountable. We have to remind ourselves in community about what we're actually about and how we are going to act in, our, in challenging and working with public officials. And I think on the side of the government officials, and this is you know, something I certainly tried to do, it didn't do perfectly, but I really tried to do it, was to say to people who, disagree, who I knew disagreed with the administration strongly on many issues, but agreed on others to say, we want both your cooperation and your constructive criticism. And I, I am going to be insulted if I hear that you're telling other people your criticism of the administration and you're not calling me because I'm the one who needs to hear it um, as much as anybody. So we really wanted to encourage it. And the great thing about the office that I ran was that I could say to everyone, you know what, you may disagree with this administration about everything except feeding hungry children. And if that's the case, we still want to work with you. So please, you know, give me a call. Let's work together. And I bet you we're going to find that we agree about more than just feeding hungry children. But I did have people come, you know, in that spirit and say, hey, I, I was surprised. I didn't know that we could work with you. Um, but this is something that we have to cultivate. We have to send the right signals. We have to, when we're part of political administrations, signal to our colleagues that, you know, the people that they want to beat up on right now because they're disagreeing with, with us on something are the people we're really going to need tomorrow. And so even if it's only for pragmatic reasons, be mindful of that. These are people we have relationships with, and they are not our enemies, and we should not ever speak of them that way. So it's a duty to police, you know, the settings where we operate and to try to make sure that we're striving at all times to leave, live up to our principles um, that should cut a, you know, should be rise above any political party or any partisan position. 
in, in my experience is that's the way you worked. But it must have been quite a conversation with your colleagues who say, you know, glad they're working with Don Hunger. They're killing us on abortion and uh, uh, HHS mandate and this sort of thing. One of the things, I'm going to ask Rick a similar question. It seems like uh, there are some people on the left, some people in the Democratic Party, including some of your former colleagues, have decided their coalition basically has moved beyond uh, traditional religious believers. That it's a sort of coalition of the elites and maybe the poor, and that the, the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, uh, the single people, gay folks, uh, that that's the future for the Democratic Party and uh, sort of traditional blue collar Catholic, uh, the Democratic Party used to reach out in a very disciplined way to Catholics and evangelical voters, doesn't seem to be. What, uh, what danger is there in a party that essentially writes off uh, a big part of the country? You dealt with this, I mean, it's, I'm not imagining things. There are people who think that people who believe what we believe are simply not worth the effort or a big part of the problem. Well, I think it's a huge mistake to write off people in the way you describe. And, and I, I think that President Obama also believes that that's a huge mistake. The way he conducted his campaigns were always to reach out to everybody, to go places, you know, where other people may have been um, reluctant to go where there were differences on abortion, for example. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a real mistake not to reach out to religious people of all stripes, um, to reach out to people, for example, in the case of Democrats, to reach out to people who disagree with a democratic platform on abortion. I think that Democrats ought to be reaching out to people who disagree with them on that issue and reaching out to them not to say, you should change your beliefs about abortion. Um, reaching out to them to say, uh, let's dialogue about where we agree and where we disagree. And I think that's a really important thing for us to, those of us who, who, uh, who are Democrats, to be able to push um, our own party and for those in the Republican Party to do work um, to make sure that we end up having campaigns that are about America and about every citizen, and that we build up places in the highest office in the land, in the White House, that truly have the <coughs> aim of serving and representing all Americans, which is the way that it has been, I think, to a large degree, and always should be, but we're in danger of losing that right now. Right. So we have to work really hard on that. Well, and just to be clear, while there might be some Democrats and progressives who are ready to write off, uh, large parts of the community, including some parts of the Catholic and evangelical community. There are Catholic and evangelical leaders who are more than willing to write off the Democratic Party uh, in a fundamental way. Rick, uh, you come from a small Midwestern <laughs> university uh, that some of us are familiar with. Uh, you uh, are a professor of law, you're a dean. That's almost as bad as being the rector of the Jesuit community. I've been liberated from the dean part. Uh, yeah. uh, you have a BA from Duke, uh, a law degree from Yale University. You've written lots of books and articles about all this. You've started a program at Notre Dame on church, state, and society. Uh, you clerked for Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, you also clerked for the Chief Judge of the Eighth Circuit, Richard Arnold. Uh, you've been deeply involved in trying to improve Catholic education, and the thing I most admire on your whole resume is you served on the school board of your local parish school. Uh, no time in purgatory for you. Uh, uh, one of the things I admire and how I came to know you is you blog. I mean, you write these very learned law review articles and books, but you also blog and you tweet. And uh, the other day, your tweet was from today's homily. It's not as important as we like our neighbor as we remember God loves our neighbor and acts accordingly. Uh, better homily than we had. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Bishop said we ought to be in solidarity. I'm really sorry for what happened to Notre Dame last Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it goes better. You have, uh, let me try and go back to the question I asked uh, Bishop McElroy. You've been studying Murray all your life. Uh, you have a copy of the book there. <laughs> How do you think his ideas uh, offer a criteria for what we're experiencing today or some directions for how we ought to deal with today. Yeah, as I said, in a church led by Pope Francis, in a country led by uh, President Trump. How do you think it holds up? How has it been overwhelmed by other events? And what is the wisdom that's still there mm -hmm. that we ought to be pursuing? Well, I think I'm going to take up the Archbishop's invitation and answer in only 140 characters. <laughs> so okay. I'm, I'm half done now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because I'm a law professor, I'm really adept at avoiding questions and, and answering ones that weren't asked. So before I answer your question, I actually wanted to say something in response to uh, uh, Melissa's discussion uh, and to your praise of, of her uh, work uh, in the administration. A couple years ago, I was part of an effort of a number of people who were interested in um, the faith-based initiative and in religious freedom. And we were trying to convince the administration to retain uh, rules that had been put in place by the Clinton administration and carried through by the second Bush administration that would allow social welfare agencies, even if they participated in federal funding programs, to still maintain their religious character, whether that had to do with you know, art on the walls or programming or m most controversially, uh, hiring for mission. And the administration was under a lot of pressure, uh, the Obama administration, from a really large and pretty impressive <laughs> coalition of activist groups who are urging them uh, to scrap this rule on the ground that the, the government shouldn't be funding what they call discrimination. And our position was that that was the wrong way to think about it, that instead we should think about the government as funding the good works that these organizations do, and they should be able to maintain their religious character. And I know that Melissa was in the middle of this, um, and uh, she would receive various missives and tomes from, um, from both sides. And I think everybody involved in that conversation uh, would agree that uh, she engaged in the kind of thoughtful dialogue and engagement that you were asking about and that Melissa was discussing. So that's something really to be admired, and I, I do admire it a lot. I appreciated it. Uh, with respect to your question, I, I cheated. I'm way over 240 characters now, or 280 characters. <laughs> I think, um, for me, something that's really relevant right now that hasn't been overtaken by events that's not anachronistic about Murray's work is something that uh, Archbishop McElroy hinted at. He said in passing that um, Murray would have thought that politics at its worst is tribal. And I think that's really powerful because Murray liked to quote this line that civilization is men and women, he said men, but he, he would have meant men and women, engage, uh, locked together in argument. He used that phrase a lot, locked together in argument. So he wasn't naive in thinking that democracy requires sort of constant niceness or constant agreement or the muting of disagreements. But he did believe, and again, uh, Archbishop McElroy made this point, that standing on the foundation of, the, of this shared consensus and of what he called civic friendship, a, uh, a kind of presumption of goodwill on the part of your fellow citizens, that standing on that foundation, then what politics was, was being locked together in argument. Um, and I think where we are right now, and again, my, my colleagues have made this point already, is we're screaming a lot, tweeting a lot, snarking a lot, tweet storming a lot, you know, uh, doing all kinds of stuff on, uh, on, on social media and in kind of drive-by op-eds and so on. We're not really arguing because Murray thought that argument really meant kind of sympathetically occupying the position of the other, um, setting out one's, both one's premises and one's uh, steps, listening to the response, engaging in dialogue, as you put, Melissa. And so I think his challenge, his, his holding up of this ideal of politics, which again, it wasn't, it wasn't naive that everybody's going to agree. He, he once said that um, he was commenting on the e pluribus unum, you know, out of many, one. And he, he, he emphasized that the, the unity that the American political experiment envisions is not homogene homogeneity. There's room for pluralism. The unity is a unity of a limited order. It comes from articles of peace, not articles of faith, right? Um, but 
but it, there was still this possibility of even a properly bounded politics could be one that could safely um, leave space for arguments among people of goodwill. And I really feel like we've lost that uh, to a great extent. And I'm sure the, the, it's overdetermined why we've lost it. And I'm sure there's plenty of blame to go around. But uh, for me, that's one of the, of the lessons of Murray that uh, really uh, carries through. The second for me, just to be kind of parochial, I mean, you mentioned that I run this program on church, state, and society. Um, its mission statement is just kind of completely ripped off from Murray's books. <laughs> it's very Murray-inspired. Um, the way I think about these matters has been shaped by my, my reading and probably by limited understanding uh, of him. But he, he was really prescient, I thought, uh, in his writings in the late 40s and then through the 50s. He was responding to what he thought was the Supreme Court's wrong turn in how the court was understanding the separation of church and state. Uh, he was deeply committed to that principle, but he always characterized it in the American tradition as a friendly separation that permitted cooperation, as opposed to a kind of um, uh, either a, a Jacobin statism on, uh, or a total privatization of religion. You know, he thought there was, there was room in a separationist regime for cooperation. And uh, as where that, one of the places that led him was to emphasize the freedom of the church, I'm drawing on some medieval ideas. Um, he said the church needs to have the freedom to be itself in civil society. And he insisted that that's not inconsistent with the separation of church and state, for the, church, for the churches to be witnesses, to be salt and light, to be presence, present rather in the political sphere. I think today, one of the real challenges in the religious freedom arena is a tendency to, uh, to reduce religion and religious freedom and the fundamental right to religious conscience to a private, individual, subjective experience. That's obviously a very important part of it. But Murray would have always believed that r religious faith and religious exercise has a, a communitarian and an institutional dimension and that that has to be protected too. That was more than 280 characters, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you talked about tribal and sort of where we've lost our way. Earlier today, uh, Bishop McElroy, <laughs> you'd think Bob, uh, <laughs> uh, said judicial uh, nominations are a particular flashpoint that have gone haywire. Uh, your colleague, Amy Barrett, uh, from Notre Dame Law School was before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and that led to a huge controversy about her, her views, and the questions of some senators. She was asked uh, if she was an Orthodox Catholic. Uh, she was asked, it was, someone said, the dogma lives deep within you, and that was not a compliment. Uh, as somebody who's clerked for Supreme Court Chief Justice, as somebody who watches this, um, what should be the questions about how our faith guides our choices? What should be the criteria for public service? What are, what are appropriate questions? What are inappropriate questions? Yeah. You know who wrote very thoughtfully about this um, was a person who once taught at, at Notre Dame and then became a federal judge, uh, John Noonan. Uh, he had a book on the religious judge. and um, he emphasized in various contexts, including in some judicial opinions, that um, uh, obviously the, the judge plays a role in our legal system, our legal system, which is meant to be impersonal. At least in its ideal, it's impersonal. So on the one hand, it is true to say that to agree to serve as a judge means um, to, no one can ever put aside who they are, but it does involve committing yourself to deciding a case on the grounds of the law that's given to you rather than on your own preferences and um, commitments. Um, I, should, I should say uh, disclosure and all that. I mean, uh, Professor Barrett, now Judge Barrett, has been my friend for 20 years and um, is the godmother to one of my children. And uh, I respect her immensely as a scholar and a teacher, um, and I think she'll be an outstanding judge. I think. Um, some people said in the public debate following her hearings, which I think were um, not edifying, some people said, well, uh, the critics are, are, are wrong. Of course it's appropriate to ask a judge whether they're gonna follow the law. And of course it is. Um, and Professor Barrett was asked that and she answered it as in, in the way that um, nobody could have had any complaint about, I think. I think what was, a, what was of concern, scratch that. 
Second, it's also perfectly appropriate, I think, um, to, to ask a judge, to confirm with a judge that they understand that um, one's religious commitments, however fervently held and however deeply a part of your person they are, that that's not the job you're taking on. And it's not a question of the law being above religious faith, at least in, in my view, it's not. But you take, you take a job, you take a certain role, and judges agree to play that role. So it's, a, it's perfectly appropriate to ask that too. I think what, was, um, uh, what crossed the line into being inappropriate, or maybe even worse, in the Barrett case, was that it was uh, two things. One was that um, her academic work was systematically and really embarrassingly misrepresented uh, in ways that were designed to make it look like she had views about the relationship between faith and law that she didn't have. In fact, multiple senators proceeded on the basis of an assumption that she had written X when in fact she'd written not X. And there, and there was no excuse for the senators not knowing that. And they were, they were fed these talking points by groups and it was, it was not attractive. Um, the second thing that was troubling to me, uh, and the, the question from Senator Feinstein kind of got at this, was there was sort of an echo maybe of, of, a, of a John Courtney Murray chapter. You know, the, when, when Murray was writing in the late 40s, one of the best sellers in America was Paul Blanchard, who had a book called uh, uh, American Freedom and Catholic Power, the thesis of which was that you couldn't trust Catholics with political power, and in fact, they were a bigger threat to American freedom than the Soviets. Um, so there was sort of a sense that you couldn't believe Catholics if they told you they were good citizens. You couldn't believe Catholics if they told you that they were going to join with you in the civic enterprise. Um, even after Judge Barrett clarified the misunderstandings about her work, and even after she said very plainly that she understood the judicial role, there was still this, this suspicion that we don't, we don't believe you. And I feel like the we don't believe you really did echo some of the uh, anti-Catholicism of the past. It really strikes me that uh, a question that might be appropriate to ask a uh, godmother, are you an Orthodox Catholic? <laughs> Uh, probably is not an appropriate for a congressional <laughs> hearing. Uh, the, uh, I, do you, you made some comments about this earlier in the day. Do you want to address this? Mm -hmm. or? It, it's, it's part of a wider concern I have that um, with our, as I mentioned before, about our institutions becoming politicized in a way that undermines their ability to function and help our society thrive as a, as a political society and invite us into dialogue together. And, and I, I myself, you, you can say, where did it begin? Did it begin with the Fordist domination? I tend to begin it with the, the Bork domination. I think since then it's been a downhill slide in terms of judicial nominations, the partisanship that comes into play on both sides. And I think that's corrosive, frankly because the courts have an important role in our society that if it becomes just another part of the partisan uh, categorization that occurs in people's minds, we've lost something very important. The same thing with our scientific agencies now. If those become politicized in a partisan way, we're in, we're in grave difficulties. So, um, and to, to, to reflect a minute on, on the on the role of uh, the church or of um, religious communities. In, in a way, for us as Catholics, for me as a Catholic bishop, there's a, there's a luxury we have as Catholic bishops in that it's hard for us sometimes, but our key issues lie on both sides of the partisan spectrum now. That is, uh, for us, the issues, say, of of uh, uh, abortion euthanasia tend to be issues in which Republican candidates are more supportive, issues of, of economic justice for the poor, the environment, are issues where Democrats. So we're split, but that helps keep us honest, I think. It helps us from being sucked into what you were referring, for, uh, you were referring to uh, was earlier was uh, that we not be used too much, because if we're going to be, if we're going to have integrity to what our beliefs are, then we're always going to be criticizing part of what you do and supporting part of what you do. But beyond that division of the partisan spectrum, there's another role I don't know that we're effectively playing 
and it's probably the most important role the religious community should try to play, and that is to bridge the gulf in our society and build up uh, dialogue. And that's where, to get back to Pope Francis, in a sense, Murray and Francis have this similarity. Murray was uh, dedicated to sustain dialogue across all sorts of barriers of disagreement. He called the, the, the religious communities, he talked about it as creeds at war intelligibly. That is, as you were saying, locked into dialogue with each other. And um, Pope Francis talks about it, in a sense, as accompaniment. It's seen, you mentioned about the, the seeing the other side, a walking with the other person. And that's where I think Pope Francis really beckons to us on this question. Because what he says is, in this theme of accompaniment, unless we're willing to walk with each other, and that means try to understand uh, what are the issues from their perspective? What is the personal history that lies behind it? What's the suffering there? Uh, uh, what, what are the relationships that are at stake? If we do that, if, if we as religious communities, I don't think we're effectively doing that now. I don't know magically how we do that, but I don't think we're doing that effectively. But if you ask me what's the most effective contribution religious communities should make to the American uh, polity at this time, it's that. Mm -hmm. it, it's inviting and building that kind of uh, bridges in conversation and encouraging our communities to not buy into the tribalism and the splits, but rather to walk with the other person, accompany the other person, and see it, genuinely try to see it through their eyes, which is hard for all of us. Yeah. Uh, I want to follow up with that with all three of you, but before two things I should have done at the beginning, I always forget this. You can join our conversation online on Twitter, uh, and our hashtag is faith and, uh, and democracy, and I should have said that at the beginning, and I should have said it in the middle, and now I'm seeing it near the end. Faith and democracy is our hashtag at CST Georgetown. Uh, the second thing I want to recognize the, that the Democracy Fund, uh, who is our partner in this, has been trying to increase civility and uh, strengthen democratic institutions. That's going really well right now. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, uh, but Chris Crawford, our friend, is here. But we really appreciate that because, frankly, what the bishop said is the religious community should be a source of civility and building up the common ground and strengthening democracy. But here's my question. Aren't we a part of the problem? I mean, if you look at the role of religion in public life, some of the worst uh, acting out, some of the demonizing, some of the misjudgment, uh, some of the assumptions uh, about other people, other beliefs, in the political arena come from religious groups and to the two Catholics on the panel, hasn't the political polarization in our society now seeped into the, uh, our ecclesial life? People are saying the Pope is guilty of heresy. I always thought the question was whether I agree with the Pope, not whether the Pope agreed with me. But hasn't this sort of war room mentality uh, spread from politics to the religious community, to within the Catholic community? What's your take? You were in the middle of the crossfire. Yeah, no, I think it has um, to, to a large and what, degree. And what should religious groups do about that? <laughs> well, uh, I think religious groups, first of all, have to recognize that we have a problem and work against that um, as best we can. And I'm not sure how it works in different religious traditions, but I can just say, you know, personally, I go to a church that's a purple church um, we've got, you know, Republicans and Democrats in the church, and, and it's a very healthy thing because there are not that many places anymore that you go to on the weekends where you're going to have, um, you know, a diverse political uh, group together. I know that's true, you know, for, for Catholics as well. So that's just one example of, you know, trying to work intentionally against the tide that would drive us back into 
our political tribes and place politics above our faith, which is something that we say we don't do, but then we can feel ourselves getting tugged in that direction. So it's a, it's a small scale solution, and I'm not sure how we scale it up, but I think being very intentional that this is happening and that we actually have to work against it and set up structures and ways to be in dialogue with people who have different political views within our religious community to remind ourselves that you know there can be um, you know good faith differences across politics and to support each other um, to try to work against this bitterness and this tribalism that's driving our culture right now. Uh, what Melissa seems to be saying is uh, that our faith should shape our politics, not the other way around. How's that working in the Catholic community? <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> uh, I, uh, so it's it's a it's a challenge. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's as new as we might sometimes think. I think this has been something that religious communities in America have struggled with for a long time. Um, one thing I notice at, with the students I work with um, at, at that university in northern Indiana um, is uh, a whole lot of our really fired up, uh, faith-filled students uh, are not um, guilty of this thing we're talking about. They, um, the, the students who are going to, to adoration and daily mass and the March for Life are also students who uh, care about economic justice and love Pope Francis. Um, they're pretty thoughtful, actually, about the reality of, of a purple church. Um, they, 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 they really wrestle with the thing, well, they're not going to water down, water down their commitment to the sanctity of human life in all its stages, and they're going to connect that uh, to some, some environmental issues, perhaps. I think, in a way, these, these younger folks are doing a better job than kind of the professional Catholic commentariat is doing on some of these things. How about the bishops? How are they doing? Oh, we're all one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that was certainly my experience. <laughs> um, well, I, I do say sometimes, and I believe it to be true, uh, on, the, on the substance of the issues, there's virtual unanimity among the bishops. It's on the prioritization and strategy that the differences emerge, but they can sometimes be neuralgic. I'm talking about uh, pu uh, public policy issues here, mm -hmm. and the internal issues of the church, there, that isn't so true. Uh, but I think one area that we should purge ourselves of, frankly, is not so much the positions we're taking as what argumentation or tactics we let um, slip into our way of doing things um, because uh, that demeans who we are and, and the type of witness we should be giving to the um, uh, to the body politic and to the culture I think uh, a couple years ago we had an issue um, well I'll talk about it uh, we had euthanasia in California, okay, it passed the legislature. It was signed. So we confronted the issue with the bishops of California. How could we, uh, should we be part of a referendum on this issue? Now, I have to say Catholic teaching is clear on this. The bishops of California were very <coughs> united on what the proper uh, substance of the law should be. There was no division over this question. But there was a question of should there be a referendum. So um, we, we had a poll done, you know, and so in that poll it showed, you know what push polling is where a poll was taken which is kind of a clean ask of the question and then in a push poll the poll, the, the taker of the poll asks more and more questions which are designed to push the person more toward the position you want and you see what arguments work and also how far can you get. We could get to a majority of Californians against um, euthanasia. Um, but then there was one, if you asked one question, which is um, there was a young woman called um, Brittany, I think it was Brittany Menard, and she was a, seemed a splendid young woman who lived in California, she had cancer, it was a terrible 
she was dying, her husband was by her side. They moved to Oregon and then she, she uh, 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 assisted, assisted suicide. So, uh, and, and she made videos at the time, the, the uh, Society for Compassionate Choices or whatever the name is now, made, made ads. The one quite, if you mentioned in this poll, if you mentioned the name Brittany Menard, it swung the poll back 14 points. That one image was so powerful. Okay. But as we wrestled with the question, it became at a certain point not could we win, but should we as bishops be involved in doing this because it became clear to us the only way to win was not to advance the arguments that we as a church believe in on this question, but rather a series of, to us, side arguments that poison support for euthanasia. So should we do that? That became the question. Mm -hmm. And so it really was, should we as faith communities be buying into those tactics that we decided no, mm -hmm. okay? But I think on a whole range of moments, we as faith communities are confronted with that question. Okay. Uh, what, what should we or should not do or be? And how does that not feed the worst of our political culture at the present? So anyway. Uh, let's take time for some questions from people who have come out tonight. We have a couple microphones or at least one microphone. Uh, put your hand up, identify yourself, and please put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> who, would, who do we got? Okay. We can't see up here, so. Yeah. No, uh, not much. <laughs> uh, I need a hat. Stand up and identify yourself. My name is Thomas O'Hara, and I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. I think one thing we might do, and I'd like the reaction of the panel on this, is celebrate each other's uh, uh, victories and anniversaries. We just passed the 500th anniversary of the uh, Luther's Theses. And I'm not the best informed person, but I didn't see much celebration or reaching out on the, the, the part of the Catholic Church or Catholic institutions to, to pick the positive things from those theses and celebrate them and to shake hands and embrace our Lutheran brethren. Uh, and I think there are other, th other things too that we could do, not so much in policy or intellectual things or, or religious things even, but just to celebrate jointly those things that are going well. Okay. Well, I can say that I actually was sitting on this stage uh, around the celebration of the Reformation for an event on the Reformation here with Lutheran and Catholic colleagues. So, um, so I guess we did a little of that here at Georgetown, and that was that was really great with uh, Tom Farr and his his group. Um, but uh, I think it's I think it's a wonderful idea in reminding each other of our shared humanity. It's just you know every opportunity that we get to do that. Is, is worth so much. I grew up in Minnesota where I thought there were only Catholics and Lutherans. <laughs> and uh, when I was about eight years old, I told my best friend, Louis Wyman, that it was great he was my best friend, but it was a shame he was going to hell because he was a Lutheran. <laughs> and his mother called my mother, and it was explained to me that that was not a good thing to say. <laughs> and I said, but that's what sister told me. And my mother said, sister is always right except about this. <laughs> so we sort of worked that out in Minnesota a long time ago. Other questions? Come. Over here, there's one. Hi, my name is Kevin Appleby. I'm with the Center of Migration Studies of New York. Uh, this is for Melissa and for Bishop and Professor, if you want to join in. Um, so in terms of national leaders, presidents, and faith leaders, you look at the laying on of hands and the photo ops, mm -hmm. and this is a cynical question, so disabuse me of it. Mm -hmm. So my perception is that the politicians benefit from the photo op, and yeah, it's good to be seen with the pope, it's good to be seen with the cardinals, evangelical leaders, but when push comes to shove, and the decisions have to be made, that the faith communities or sort of dismiss some ways, unless they can show that they have power at the ballot box or overwhelming 
the White House switchboard or whatever the case may be. Um, is that a wrong perception or do faith leaders add something else to the debate that national leaders really listen to? And for the bishop, when you're doing Pickett's Charge, let's go on poverty, let's go on immigration, do you look behind you and say, there's no one behind me? What am I gonna do about that? What's the church gonna do? Because from where we sit in the pews, the church is so divided, it's hard to really be a political force because we are so divided, whether it be a pro-life issue or immigration issue or something in between. So how does the church overcome that? So my question for Melissa is, what's the view from the politician's standpoint? And then from the bishop's view, how can we overcome whatever that perception may be and really have political power? Yeah. This comes from uh, somebody with a lot of experience. Kevin has been a, a real champion of immigrant rights and human dignity and uh, probably has some feelings about both these things. So, uh, yeah, well, and how I, many divisions has the Pope? <laughs> Um, and I want to say just a, a word of thanks to Kevin because uh, we were able to work with Kevin on so many issues during when I was in the White House, and he was one of those guys that you really wanted on speed dial. <laughs> um, so I'm grateful for his work and, and cooperation with us whenever whenever we could. And and Kevin was great about if I can use an example, Kevin, uh, telling us to, shooting us straight and saying, you know, okay, this is a real problem. This is a real problem that we've got with the administration and you know I'm just laying it out there for you. And, um, and I really appreciate that. I mean, I think it, it is a problem. We have politicians and they have views that um, you know, they ran on to achieve certain things and those will be in sync with certain religious communities and not in sync with others and then in sync part of the time with some religious communities and not in sync with others. Um, so it's a real problem that you mentioned. Um, I, I think that I wouldn't say that, that it is the ironclad rule that that's the way that works, that, you know, well, it's the party platform, and if you're not with that, then we're not going to listen to you. Because I can think of instances where, you know, decisions were made because people came in and talked to us about things that were not where somebody would guess, you know, the Obama administration would be headed. And because we had an intervention with some people who said, this is a real problem, this is not a good thing to do, uh, it changed our minds. So it happens. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I'm just thinking this through, so pardon me for thinking a little bit out loud, but I think one of the great things to do um, is to go upstream in politics. Um, and by that, I mean um, to try to engage people, and I know the, the Catholic Church does this, but I think a lot of other people don't, uh, try to engage people when they're candidates before they get in public office and present to them, like, for example, the Bread for the World Circle of Protection, presents to candidates um, a, you know, a, a questions about poverty while they're running and asks them to make promises about those issues while they're running so that once they are in office, they're on the hook with some things that they have promised to particular people about particular things. And I think that religious communities, without getting partisan, because the circle of protection isn't, um, and I, I don't think that would be a good idea to get partisan, but without getting partisan, should try to go upstream a lot and make sure that they are becoming part of the promises that the candidate is making so that when once the candidate is elected, then you are part of that agenda that the candidate has built as opposed to being something that just dropped in right after he or she got elected. I think that would be helpful if religious communities could do that toward the problem you described. Just for those who may not be familiar, the Circle of Protection, David Beckman, uh, President of Bread for the World, is uh, co-chair of the Circle, has been working together, Christian communities, Bishop's Conference, Salvation Army, Sojourners, Bread for the World, National Association of Evangelicals, Mainlines, to protect the poor in the budget process and has worked very hard and really quite remarkably to keep very substantial cuts from happening to food stamps and Medicaid working tonight on the tax bill. But that's an example where collaboration across lines uh, and a really wide range of Christian leaders. Uh, how many troops? Do you well, feel you uh, have? 
we have 800,000 Hispanic Catholics in the <laughs> Diocese of San Diego. Um, but those are not troops. On an issue like uh, immigration, our relationship with them is multifaceted. I mean, there are parishioners, for one thing, people of faith. But one of these, in a time like this, we have to be in solidarity with them. You know, I, I, I see the suffering there in the, this current climate of on these, uh, on, uh, with our broken system on immigration. And so our primary role is to minister to them, be one with them, and so, uh, but, but, but to empower them also and help them empower us and, and also through narrative to widen the reach of their uh, stories so that they embrace the, the also 700,000 uh, Anglo-Catholics that we have in the diocese too. Our biggest problem in terms of translating the most pressing priorities we have uh, really is the broken system congressionally, on, especially on immigration. It's just, it's not, the, on DACA, when we speak to people about the representatives on DACA, you can see etched on their faces, even those who, who are not naturally inclined because of the, their party preference or whatever their position is, they understand this, and lots of them would want to be of help. But the system is set up in such a way that they're paralyzed from doing what they know is the common good. And that's one of the great problems of our system at this moment. So many people are paralyzed from doing what they know is the right thing for the good of the country. How do we, un how do we unbreak that? And how can religious communities be of help in doing that? Um, that's the contribution I would hope we could make. One of the things in my experience is when the church and religious leaders bring something really distinctive to the conversation, I think of Pope Francis' leadership and the American bishops and other groups on environmental issues. They put together care for creation and care for the poor together and in so doing challenge lots of people on this debate and they, because of our experience, because of what we believe, because of our relationships, we add something different to the debate. Is there one more question before we go over here? There are a couple uh, together. Why don't you both ask a sh short question and we'll try and get an answer. Sure, thank you very much. My name is Bob Lannon. I'm a graduate of the university and I teach at the uh, School of Continuing Studies. Uh, Mr. Carr, you mentioned that uh, Father Murray would not like the multicultural movement. And I wonder if things are worse today or more poison in our, our climate on these issues because it's something somewhat the opposite of that. And I'm not denying that the multicultural movement is there and has its shortcomings, but is there a pressure toward a certain um, homogenization philosophically that uh, works against our pluralism and and liberty. If I if I'm a baker and I don't want to bake a cake for somebody's wedding, I don't have to. If I'm a pharmacist and I don't want to fill a certain prescription because I think it's abortifacient, I don't have to. There are pressures on me. Then no, now I have to. If I run a social service agency and heaven forbid I want to put a star of David on the wall, but I get some federal funds. Mm, that's a challenge for me today. Okay. Um, I I is there that pressure? And if, are we, if we ease up on those pressures, would that be a key to solving a lot of these problems? Okay, right in front of you. Well, hi, hi. my name's Daniel Street. I um, work with the World Bank Group. I'm a, I hail from Australia, but um, having lived here in um, Washington uh, for four years, um, the, the fractious state, if you like, of institutions writ large, you, um, and from, you know, the, uh, in bouncing around the world, it's, it's not just here in America. It's um, it's institutions uh, rich, writ large. Yet, what really resonated tonight from your words is institutions matter. Institutions are such a huge force and great vehicle for change. Yet, never have um, has distrust in institutions perhaps been so great. In identifying this this problem and, and its contours, I was just wondering from each of you could just perhaps offer. Um, one concrete solution um, in terms of lighting up the pathway forward. Uh, for those of us as faith, while we want to have an optimistic 
been optimistic voice um, in terms of uh, concretely, what do you think can occur um, for um, lighting up the pathway for, for, um, for this trust to, um, to be restored? What's it going to take? What concretely do you think can, can, can okay. occur? Thank you. Well, that seems to be a good final question. So any comment about pluralism and the demands it places on individual conscience? Maybe you could take well, a I, I stab at that, Rick. Uh, Murray, in, uh, in chapter nine of We Hold These Truths, um, makes, I think, pretty much the argument that's the premise of uh, Mr. Lannan's question, that, that monism is a threat to freedom properly understood, and that pluralism is a better way forward, and that the state ought not to try to homogenize on every question. Obviously, on some, we do have to have an answer. But again, we're locked together in disagreement. Um, we don't insist on unanimity on every matter. Uh, and we <laughs> accept the fact that people of goodwill are going to disagree. And that means that this needs to be some room for accommodations, even from laws that are generally, generally applicable. Uh, let me ask each of our uh, guests to follow up on the, the question. One sign of hope that uh, you see in this area. We could, we've talked a lot about the dangers and difficulties. What would be a sign of hope, a step forward, I believe was your phrase, and begin with you, Melissa. Um, well, you know, Martin Luther King said that the church is not the master or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. And it does seem to me that in, in this crisis period that we're living through, that we're seeing uh, religious communities and leaders often standing up and being the conscious of the state, which they do, they have done throughout the years, but I think it's becoming particularly important when we have a failure of political leadership for religious communities to stand up and fill that void and be the conscience of the state, especially when we have moral uh, failures and the political leadership. So that's something that, um, I'm continually inspired by, and I think particularly of uh, the religious leaders in Charlottesville who went down there to stand um, against those uh, white supremacists who were, um, who were at having their demonstration in Charlottesville. So things like that, I think, um, give me a lot of hope, and I, I do hope and pray that, that we will, as religious people, be able to continue to be the conscience of the state. Rick? Um, so the happy you thing- You can put it in the form of a tweet if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so Murray was um, uh, long interested and really committed to what he called the schools question. Uh, it was really important to him that Catholic schools, uh, you know, K through eight sort of schools, not, be not merely accepted or tolerated by the state, but actually um, respected and supported, and he believed they should be equally funded as well. I think we've seen kind of a shift in the last, let's say, decade um, away from a kind of rigid separationism when it comes to school choice matters or vouchers or tax credits and what have you. I think that's a welcome development. And I think of programs like at my little university, um, the Alliance for Catholic Education is doing a lot of work in low income communities to send really idealistic young graduates out to, to teach in some of these schools. And in the process, they're really strengthening some of these um, Catholic schools in low-income neighborhoods, which are providing great opportunities to kids who might not otherwise get them. So that's a, that's a sign of hope to me. Bishop? Sure. Just taking off uh, from Murray, Murray was dedicated to the idea that civil conversation can and must occur. When uh, I was at a meeting in uh, San Diego, of all the interreligious leaders of all the various faiths came together to discuss about, about a year ago, what could we do to heal our society? And the, 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 the uh, suggestion that got consensus was we should really try to come up with a set of aspirations for what our civil dialogue, particularly during the political season, should look like. And I do think that's probably the contribution the religious community should make. Now, we, that's something we have to be self-critical about, too, of how we do these things. But I would say it doesn't have to be just a set of rules. I feel we saw a model for how that might be, and to get back to Pope Francis, that when Pope Francis spoke to the Congress, he did speak about a vision of what politics should be 
Remember, he had those four, four figures of Lincoln, uh, Dr. King, uh, uh, Dorothy Day, and Thomas Merton. And he used those very powerfully and poignantly to speak to a way of relating to one another in the political dialogue. And uh, probably we as religious communities should have followed up on that right away in a very substantial way. So what would be a step forward that the, that's realistic for religious communities to do? If we came together and did that, that to me would be a real contribution, but doing it on, not merely on a kind of pedagogical, here's what, how you should speak to each other, but on, a, on an imaginative, affective, inspiring way like the Pope did. Here's, how, here's what your politics should look like. Here's what you should be reaching for. I think that would be a contribution. At the beginning, you talked about the Pope teaches very often not with words, but with actions. The most powerful thing the Pope did that day in Washington was not that remarkable presentation. He went out and greeted people, and then he left the most powerful people yeah. in the country and went to be with the least powerful people in the city and taught us something about priorities. You said aspirations. I'm recalled, and Melissa mentioned this, Somewhere in the faithful citizenship documents over the years, it said our task, and I think Murray might uh, agree with this, is to be political but not partisan, to be principled but not ideological, to be civil but not soft, and then to be engaged and not used. Uh, join me in thanking these people uh, who...